This is the story of a nightmare, a demon that strikes healthy teenagers and young adults, that robs them of past, present, future, even life itself. You know, schizophrenia is about the most complicated and fascinating disease that people have because it has, it's so complex, it has so many different kinds of symptoms. I heard little voices like angels. I thought I could fly. Feels like my head's exploding. Feels like my head's going into spontaneous combustion, man. Schizophrenia is not split personality. Schizophrenia is not a creative adaptation that an individual makes to an insane world. I walked down the street crying. I was crying all the time for no reason. And, and people would say, why is that girl crying? And, I'd, I'd explode. I'd say, don't you understand? This is a no-fault disorder. This is not something that's due to a willful child or somebody who just wants to be different. Every voice was God. And so everything they told me to do was a command from God, and I was a good Christian, so I had to do what they said. Schizophrenia is a brain disease that expresses itself in terms of disturbances of thinking, and perception and behavior. Paranoia, hallucinations, emotional withdrawal. For victims of schizophrenia, everyday life is a strange and terrifying journey. Schizophrenia shatters people's ability to feel or communicate, to understand or interact with the everyday world. The symptoms represent what we know best about the disease. What we don't know is exactly why it strikes, who will be the next victim, or how to stop it. This film is a journey into the lives of people who suffer from schizophrenia and the scientists who are trying to understand it. Nobody knows. <laughs> it's, it's a mystery why this happens. Uh, it seems to be part of the human condition. Uh, in that it is a uniquely human disorder, as far as we know, and about 1% of the population worldwide uh, has the disease. 1% of the world population. One out of every 100 children, regardless of race, sex, economic class, or culture, will fall victim to the disease of the fragmented mind. Among its victims, we find prodigies and prophets, great artists, and mass murderers. But mostly, we find ordinary people like ourselves, our brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. This is part of the human condition in that it's something that uh, some people are going to have. Schizophrenia strikes young men and women, most often between the ages of 15 and 30 and sends them into a state of endless mental agony. I think of it as a, an extremely tragic disease because it pulls the rug out from people, psychologically speaking, right when they're entering the time of their life. In schizophrenia, it's totally silent for up to two decades during infancy, childhood, and early adolescence. You have people who are valedictorians and the best athletes in school, the most popular individuals, and boom, they develop schizophrenia and everything changes. Oh. Do you think you've had a difficult life? Oh, yeah, I've had a lot of suffering. In my, oh, I've had a lot of suffering, yeah. Do you think your life has been harder than, like, other people? Much harder than most people I know. How can you ask that question when I've had 71 psychiatric institutionalizations? Steve was the eldest son of a family from Scarsdale, New York. As a child, his brain was a gift of the gods. It carried him through the best schools in the country. As an adult, it turned against him, drove him into mental institutions not 71, but 76 times. Steve blamed his problems on his mother, who was overprotective. His mother blamed it on his father, who was oversensitive. His father blamed it on Steve's friends, who gave him LSD. 
The doctors said that Steve had schizophrenia. Steve's mother told the doctors they had schizophrenia. No one in Steve's family knew what schizophrenia was. Steve, can you describe the transition when you started, you know, feeling psychotic? Oh, what, what? yeah, it's like, going to, it's like going to sleep in a penthouse in Manhattan and somehow, and somehow waking up in, uh, on the suburbs of Nairobi in the jungle. It's, it's as dramatic as that, yeah. In 1969, Steve had graduated from MIT and just finished his first year of medical school. At age 21, he suffered the first of many psychotic attacks. A world full of promise was flooded with fear and paranoia. How do you describe paranoia? I mean... Paranoia becomes just... It's so incredibly intense that... The feeling that everybody in the room knows what you're thinking. The feeling that everybody in the room wants to control you and get you to act in a certain way. Either socially, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, or sexually. They're all trying to force you to do certain things and act and think in a certain way. For Steve, life became a painful roller coaster ride between madness and clarity, and his own brain became his worst enemy. Intense suffering for me is going beyond my limits. Being having too many neurons fire at once, having too many planes, being on too many planes at the same time. If you're asking how it affects my body, goddamn, I don't know. No, what is it? Feels it? like my head's exploding. Inside this box is the most sophisticated computer known to man. It can analyze complex situations and process multiple sensory inputs simultaneously. Inside this box is a human brain. At the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center in Massachusetts, Dr. Stephen Vincent and his staff search for clues to the causes of insanity by studying the difference between healthy and diseased brains. Every time we have a brain here that we're processing, uh, my staff and myself are constantly in awe of the miracle of what it is and the power of what it is and the ultimate mystery of what the human mind is and, and how the human brain functions. A convoluted mass of fatty tissue, blood vessels and fluid weighing under two pounds on average, the human brain has been the subject of clinical research for generations. This brain was alive only four hours earlier. Scientists have found visible differences in the size and shape of certain regions of the brains of some people with schizophrenia. But the findings are not consistent. And, when viewed under the microscope, it is virtually impossible to distinguish the brain tissue of a person with schizophrenia from that of a normal individual. So what is it that makes a schizophrenic brain different from a normal brain? Science uh, is now showing us that the differences are at the level of brain wiring and brain chemistry. Most brain activity involves communication between cells called neurons. Messages are sent by chemicals called neurotransmitters, such as dopamine and serotonin. In people with schizophrenia, these chemicals are often found in abnormal levels. But this imbalance in brain chemistry is only one reason for the communications breakdowns of schizophrenia. Increasingly, neurologists attribute some of these problems to irregularities in the structural organization of brain cells, patterns first established during fetal brain development. 
During the second trimester of pregnancy, neurons actually migrate to build specific pathways in the brain. Any errors at this stage have lasting repercussions. The brains of these individuals with schizophrenia are wired somewhat differently. That is, the neurons are interconnected, perhaps in different patterns than those of brains of individuals who are normal. Only recently has modern technology given researchers the necessary tools to begin to understand the physical functions of the brain. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, is used to create detailed images of the living brain at work processing information. Dr. Nancy Andreessen from the University of Iowa was a pioneer in this field. The most compelling evidence for what is wrong with the brain in schizophrenia comes from functional imaging studies where we can base the circuits in the brain. Circuits are areas that are interconnected with one another uh, and that have to communicate with one another. You can think about it as, you know, programs on a computer making calls here and there for pieces of information or whatever. And in, in schizophrenia, those circuits aren't working right and they're calling up connections and they're misconnecting. And because they're misconnecting, sometimes people get the wrong information and hear voices when they shouldn't, or they misinterpret things that they see. Scientists believe the problems are in part genetic. Human brain wiring begins at conception. Sensitive ultrasound imaging now allows researchers to monitor development of the fetal brain inside the womb. In those early stages where neurons are being generated and they're migrating to their final positions and sending out branches to connect to other brain cells, it is thought that there may be some differences in the way that's happening with individuals who eventually are diagnosed with schizophrenia in their young adult time. By tracking subjects from the womb right on through onset of the disease, researchers hope to pinpoint when and how the structural damage of schizophrenia strikes the brain. We know how parts of it work. We know a lot about neurochemistry and receptors and development of the brain. But piecing that all together as a functioning whole unit of a human being with emotions and memory and uh, personality, uh, that we don't understand. Stephen and Sean are identical twins. They grew up in a small village outside of Newcastle, England. As children, no one could tell them apart, not even their parents. Same genes, same family, same environment. But today, there is one big difference. At the age of 30, one is healthy. One has schizophrenia. How has he changed? He's a lot quieter now, you know, and more in himself, you know. And he, he does, he's like more lethargic, he doesn't get motivated much. Once open and uninhibited, today, Sean hardly ever ventures outside of his home. As boys, the twins were indistinguishable and inseparable. Whatever they did, they did together. They started a rock band. They played soccer, partied, drank, and experimented with drugs. Sean's talents led him to one of England's top art schools. At 20, he was designing award-winning logos for a prestigious graphic design company in London. Then, his mind and his life collapsed. It was like almost getting distinctions in that, which is like the highest grade you can get. And we used to do like freelance work, sometimes for proper companies. Could you do that today, do you think? Oh, that's too much pressure on that type of work. I mean, you've got to meet deadlines and everything. Today, at the age of 30, the twins are still inseparable. The disease that has shattered Sean's childhood dreams has leveled his brother, Stephen, as well. Both men are unemployed. Stephen is devoted to helping his brother cope in a chaotic world. The two are inseparable, 
but no longer indistinguishable. If the problem wasn't there, everything would be a, a lot better, you know? I mean, I think it must be a lot worse for Sean, you know, because he's got the problem, you know? Two things keep Sean in touch with the world, his brother and antipsychotic drugs. If I didn't take the medication, I'd be locked up now. Can you tell me, like, what you would do, what you think? I'd probably just start fighting or try and kill someone. Did you ever worry that you were going to get the same disease? I, I still do, you know. I mean, uh, it's probably a possibility, I don't know. A possibility what? That I, that I could get it, you know. I don't see why not if, I mean, if he's getting it. We are twins. Wait, did you want twins? Once a year, Stephen and Sean leave their hometown bound for the London Institute of Psychiatry, where they are subjects in a study of twins and schizophrenia. After 10 years of living with this destroyer of the human spirit, Stephen hopes the study will confirm that his brain has escaped the disease. Sean is hoping that someday science will come up with a cure for an affliction that from its very onset buried him in a state of confusion and paranoia. First, I thought I was turning telepathic and I would read people's minds and that because I didn't know what was going on. And then I thought it might be like spirits or ghosts or something. The first terrors of schizophrenia are only heightened by the victim's inability to comprehend the symptoms of onset. At first, Sean had no idea what was happening. Vivid hallucinations and growing paranoia convinced him that he was possessed. Soon, he believed that his own brother was part of a plot against him. As time went on, it got that much that he was questioning us all the time. And I thought, hold on, this is getting serious, you know? He actually thinks that I'm seeing things against him or plotting something. Sean's psychosis was not the first time the twins had encountered the disease. When the boys were five years old, their mother was hit by schizophrenia and her sanity shattered forever. Watching his brother fall victim was devastating for Stephen. But it wasn't just lightning striking twice. Scientists now believe that schizophrenia is partly hereditary. Schizophrenia has its origins uh, basically at conception. That is, it is a disease in which there's a genetic vulnerability. Having one parent with schizophrenia, Sean and Stephen had a one in eight chance of inheriting the disease. But like 50% of all sets of identical twins with the disease, schizophrenia has struck only one of the pair, which tells us that it's more than just genetic. Genes mean that it's necessary to develop the disease, but not by themselves sufficient to develop the disease. There's something more that's needed. What is the more? Uh, the more has to come from the environment. At the London Institute of Psychiatry, Stephen and Sean are part of a study tracking 160 sets of twins. Here and around the world, scientists are searching for reasons why one twin can be stricken by schizophrenia while the other escapes. Twins are a fascinating group of people in that here you've got an identical uh, pair. They share exactly the same genes. You can try and tease out uh, the influences of the genes versus the influences of the environment. Dr. Farouk Ahmad is one of the specialists searching for the triggers to psychosis in the London study of twins. Even though we think of them having a common shared environment, the environment itself can be very different. For example, during pregnancy, the blood supply to one twin may be more than to the other twin, which would affect uh, its growth and also the brain development. 
And we know from other studies that birth complications are important in, uh, 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 in predisposing people to developing schizophrenia. Sean was born with two strikes against him, a mother who would fall victim to schizophrenia and, born 20 minutes after his brother, a birth marked by complications. Their painful history makes the brothers perfect subjects for study. Using magnetic resonance imaging, Dr. Ahmad is looking for signs of how the disease has changed Sean's brain. Sean, can you hear me? I'm going to ask you to uh, start with a word as soon as you see the letter. For people with schizophrenia, even basic mental tasks can be overwhelming. By tracking blood flow within the brain, the MRI monitors how the brain tackles a job. Comparing results from Stephen and Sean's tests would reveal the difference in how their brains work and look. Stephen, that's your brain. So I have got one. Yes, you have got one. <laughs> and so you both have got one. <laughs> We've never found one uh, anyone without a brain yet. <laughs> yeah. Have you learned anything from the tests that you've done on me and Sean? Yeah. Uh, an interesting thing which I'll point out to you here is that this is the CSF, the water, in, in the ventricles. Yeah. Um, and the ventricles are like rooms inside the brain, uh, which uh, the water flows through. If genetics were the sole factor, the twins would have identical brains. But the structural images reveal striking differences between the two brains. Sean's brain is notably smaller than his identical twin, with more water and less gray matter. Sean's ventricles are clearly enlarged and asymmetrical, a known sign of schizophrenia. Whether the brain deterioration be a result of the disease or the medication is still unknown, but Sean is desperate for the process to be stopped. I think in terms of a cure, there's nothing which will uh, cure of schizophrenia overnight, and it's a combination of medication, social inputs and psychological inputs. His brother, his family, and medication enable Sean to exist on the fringes of society. But he is a shadow of his former self. What do you think about when you look at these pictures? Oh, I just wish I was like that, like I used to be. Do you think it's unfair somewhere? I mean, do you feel like just unjust? Uh -huh. For Sean, every day is a struggle with fear, the nightmare that keeps him locked inside a lonely and frightening world. Insanity is an ancient affliction, perhaps as old as humanity itself. For much of history, the only thing as painful as the madness was the way mankind tried to deal with it. We've tried to lock it away, cut it out, shock it, or burn it out. But the nightmare refuses to disappear. Madness has always been with us. In ancient cultures, insanity was believed to be the result of a physical affliction, an imbalance of the four body fluids. The brain was the organ of the mind and susceptible to disease. But it wasn't until the Middle Ages that madness was proclaimed a sign of the devil, a punishment by God. Between 1460 and 1680, tens of thousands of mentally ill, mostly women, were burned at the stake as witches or heretics. Inhumane treatment persisted throughout the Renaissance. 
Victims of mental illness were cast into asylums and prisons, shackled and chained and left to rot in their own waste. By the 19th century, madness had become a subject for science. Still, new techniques for study, confinement, and suppression of lunacy were little more humane and no more productive than what had come before. With the 20th century and the birth of psychiatry, the disease of paranoia, withdrawal, and hallucination was defined and named. Schizophrenia, the affliction of the fragmented mind. Modern therapies like electroshock and lobotomy could still be abusive. Science had tracked the nightmare to the brain, but man was still determined to cut it out. The first real breakthrough in treatment came in 1951 with the discovery of neuroleptic drugs in France, powerful medications which diminish the experience of psychosis. Numbed by these powerful drugs, people with schizophrenia could return to a life outside of the walled institutions. But medication can only moderate the symptoms, the experience of a life lived in constant sensory overload, captive to a brain unable to tell the difference between what is real and what is imagined. Imagine a world where a busy restaurant feels like the front lines of a battlefield. where every sound, every voice, every note of music were all firing at you at the same volume. Imagine that in every glance you felt people were reading your mind, injecting thoughts into your head. That all of those imagined voices inside of your head are screaming at once in a language you don't understand. Excusez-moi, monsieur, vous avez un apéritif? Imagine living trapped in a world with no boundaries between self and other. No border between your own thoughts and the thoughts of others. <laughs> For millions of people around the globe, this is everyday life. Life in the world of schizophrenia. Now, if you and I were at a cocktail party or at a train station where there were a lot of people and many conversations going on at one time, we would be able to focus in on a single conversation by blocking out all of the other noise and conversations around us. Dr. Francine Bennis is a world-renowned scientist searching for links between brain chemistry and schizophrenic behavior. When a schizophrenic is in a crowded room with a lot of conversations occurring around them, they hear all of the conversations with equal emphasis. It becomes absolutely overwhelming to them, and the only way that they can take control over the amount of sensory information that's entering their brain is to run out of the room. Victims of schizophrenia live in fear. The inability to filter external experience from internal thought contributes to hallucinations, voices and visions that can make even familiar situations terrifying. Recently, functional imaging has enabled researchers to monitor brain activity during psychotic episodes, adding new understanding to the power of hallucination. People with schizophrenia experience hallucinations as real because their own brain tells them that the experience is real. These MRI pictures show that the activity in a brain hearing real voices is almost identical to the same brain hearing imagined voices. I'd hear someone call my name or I'd hear the phone ring or I'd hear someone at the door. So I go there and no one will be there. Wait, wait, it looks good. 
I often notice people uh, uh, going into telephone booths and talking. And then I began to uh, hear voices that I thought were like calls being made to me. Waste is not good. Is it one voice or many voices? I have several. Men, women? Uh, does it make you feel bad or do you, can you pretty much ignore them? Well, I try to ignore them, but sometimes it does make me feel bad. Mm -hmm. I see. And what is it that makes you feel bad? The remarks that that I hear, you know, being called a bum and stuff like that. So you start to take it personally? Yes, sir. <laughs> I hear, uh, sometimes I hear voices, I hear names that are talking to me. But the voices don't have names, I don't hear the voices. I don't know what the, I don't know what the voices mean. The whole world was out to get me and out to get my family, and it was just awful. For many victims, mental illness is a lifelong trap. For others, it's a recurring nightmare that shatters periods of normal life. It takes an exceptional mind to cross the frontier between sanity and madness at will. Insanity, when you're really in it, it's, it's like a dream which you, you can't wake up. Nowadays, as the dream is ending, I realize that it is a dream, and then I wake up. <laughs> John Nash, Jr. represents two of the greatest extremes of the human mind, a Nobel Prize-winning mathematician and a longtime victim of schizophrenia. As a graduate student in 1950 at Princeton University, Nash helped pioneer an entirely new field of mathematics called game theory. His groundbreaking ideas are at the root of modern economic theory. But it would take over 40 years before Nash was rewarded the Nobel Prize in economics for that very theory. 40 years because, in 1959, at the age of 30, his remarkable mind short-circuited, and John Nash, Jr. was hospitalized against his will for schizophrenia. The first time I was taken to the McLean, which is a very highly rated hospital, there were policemen. I, I struggled with them a little at the doorway, but resistance was futile. <laughs> And we realized I'd been captured like a, a chess man on a chessboard. For the next 30 years, Nash's life swung back and forth, from the depths of insanity to the heights of intellectual reasoning, from homelessness in the streets of Europe to an honorary position at Princeton. His brain was subjected to insulin treatment, electroshock, high doses of medication, and still today, Dr. Nash is in a constant struggle between irrational and rational thinking. So ultimately, I managed to get beyond hospitalization, but without actually being sane. But it, in a sense, was a sort of forced lucidity. I was forced to accept normal thinking. So I had, but I, when I came, when I went, returned to the delusional thing, I felt like I was escaping from having been under uh, 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 thought police that were forcing me to behave normally. John Nash had two sons before he developed schizophrenia. Nash has passed on both his genius and his schizophrenia to his younger son, Johnny. Dr. Nancy Andreasen has come to meet with Nash, his wife Alicia, and their son as she pursues her research in the links between creativity and mental illness. So, you're a psychiatrist? I'm a psychiatrist, yeah. What's your name? My name's Nancy. Nancy. Andreasen is the last name. I see. I'd like a little bit about what you were interested in when you were growing up. Uh, your experiences playing chess? Okay. okay, just leave me with questions, and I'll try to answer them. Okay. 
Um, when you first started having symptoms, as we would say, I was um, in my teens. You were in your teens. I was a born again uh, Christian. I was I was a fanatic. Mm -hmm. I was a religious fanatic, mm -hmm. and uh, the voices I heard, I interpreted them all as God. You know. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things did the voices say? I walked out into the middle of the highway, you know, and they, mm -hmm. they wanted me to stand there in the middle of the highway. Mm -hmm. You know, that sort of thing, you know, mm -hmm. pretty severe. Pretty severe. Yes. Yeah. I didn't realize that my father had passed on anything to me. I, I was just caught by surprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was not savvy like you psychiatrists, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. know that that sort of thing runs in the family. Mm -hmm. Instead, uh, you know, I was completely caught by surprise. I was flipped out at the time, you know, I had given up my chess and my math. And, but I d didn't really suspect that I was headed for a mental hospital. So you were in your teens, but you also managed to recover enough so that you were able to go back and eventually get a PhD in math. Well, that's a remarkable thing, yeah, that uh, during my religious insanity, I lost all ability to do mathematics. I had been a mathematical genius, you know, 800 on the essay, on, on the achievement test. but. Uh, I lost all ability to do mathematics. I couldn't add a column of numbers. Mm. But then I went back to school, the voices disappeared, and I took up math again. And I regained all my mathematical, uh, all the mathematical ability that I had lost. And I went on to get uh, a PhD, yes. Mm -hmm. I published and I taught, yeah. Mm -hmm. I followed in my father's footsteps, so to, to do honor to, to my father, you know. Yeah, yeah. And Johnny Nash, you, like his father, yeah often experienced periods where he was able to regain his full intellectual capacity. But the psychosis would always reoccur, making life a roller coaster between insanity and lucidity. But I'm still uh, suffering, you know, uh, the symptoms of mental illness. Uh, you know, I, I, I hallucinate, I still hallucinate, you know, but I can function. I function despite the mental illness, functioning schizophrenia. Uh, when you mention hallucinations, what do you mean explicitly? You mean the voice, or what do you mean? Both uh, auditory and visual. You see something? Yes. What Didn't you, you know that I, that I have visual hallucinations? Well, you claimed it once in the hospital. I remember one time... But that, you're not keeping up with me at all if you don't know that I have visual well, hallucinations. Don't uh, I, well, what, what is it? What is happening? I have visual hallucinations, Dad. What do you see? I see things in the air that aren't there, you know. How do you know? I mean, like ghostly figures or what? Like, yeah, like, like ghosts, yeah. Shadows? You see shadows? I see, you know, in the air. So it must be shadows, right? What, what do you see in the air? You could call them shadows. Well, he hasn't even kept up with me. Well, you don't. You haven't. You haven't said that well, you see it's real something. Hard. We don't. We don't see it. You have to tell us that you yeah. see. It's. Uh, you know, your parents are not your doctors, and so it's. And they don't want to intrude on your life. I. Uh, that's too bad. Well, it's been a pleasure. It's been very nice talking to you. Thanks very much. Anger, withdrawal, isolation, okay. denial. The symptoms of the disease and the reaction to them make treatment only more difficult. It's rare that an individual who develops symptoms gets diagnosed quickly, comes to treatment, and then is optimally treated for the remainder of their lives. More often, people are ignorant of what is happening to them. They really don't know. Or if they do have a sense, they don't want to say anything about it because it's a highly prejudicial and stigmatized thing to say, you know, I've, I've got some, some mental disorder. Denial is often the first reaction to the onset of schizophrenia, but it is far from the worst. Patrick's son, Gainel, was a healthy teenager of 15 when he quit high school. He told his father he quit because he thought he smelled bad. Patrick didn't think much of it until the following summer. He left school in April, and the next summer, uh, one day I had him on the telephone, and he was in total delirium. He was, was saying he incredible things. That was uh, at the time of the Olympic Games in the United States, in the United States, and he told me that uh, people on television in Houston were talking to him, and they gave him the gold medal for chaos. 
And he told me that on the telephone. And that's when I realized that something real bad had happened. I never thought it was a real disease. Even if I knew it, I knew it, I mean, rationally, but inside me, I thought it was gonna be okay one day. Just, we just had to wait and uh, we just had to act normally. I mean, I, I told him, go back to school, go and see others. I mean, it's the only way that you can recover your old self is being with others and, and acting normally again and living normally again. With antipsychotic medication, Gainel's psychosis started to improve. But despite the lucidity, his mind continued to be plagued by the symptoms of schizophrenia. And he used to tell me, oh boy, I'm, I'm mad. I'm never going to do it. Uh, and that made him very, very, very uh, unhappy. That brought us to that day when I think he felt so bad and he was kind of depressed that uh, he suddenly decided that uh, he couldn't do it anymore. So he just said he was, gonna, was going out to the cafe to have a cup of coffee and uh, he went straight into the subway and uh, under the train. And that was it. On January 27th, 1998, Gainel ended his life. He was 19 years old. 50% of the young people suffering from schizophrenia will attempt suicide. 10% of them will succeed. The sad part is, is that the longer a person remains actively symptomatic, the more time the disease has to progress, damage begins to accumulate in the brain, and the less responsive they are to treatment, and the poorer their prognosis becomes. There are some folks who are thinking about prevention, and their thesis is that if we start treating these young people with medication before the onset of the disease, that you have a high likelihood of preventing the, the, the downward effects of the disease in the brain before it actually manifests itself. So this, actually this is very controversial. You're medicating somebody for something that they don't have yet and perhaps never will have. There is no cure for schizophrenia, but medication does help to attenuate the symptoms. And the earlier the patient is treated with medication, in general, the better the outcome. At the University of North Carolina, under the direction of Dr. Jeff Lieberman, scientists are working to identify and treat patients at the earliest signs of psychosis. Dr. Diana Perkins studies the brains of first episode patients, young people dealing with the symptoms for the first time. By closely monitoring their brain structures as the disease progresses, Dr. Perkins hopes to determine whether schizophrenic brain anomalies stem from birth or develop over time. We're, we're very interested in the earliest stages of the illness for, for many reasons. One, it will give us more information about what may cause schizophrenia. And we also hope that by intervening early, we can, may even be able to prevent the onset of, of psychosis, the onset of the illness. I was having some suicidal thoughts, and I, what brought me into the hospital originally um, this last time was I was trying, I thought I could fly. Teresa is one of the first episode patients who has come to Dr. Perkins looking for answers. There was a meteor shower and, and when the stars fall from the sky, I always thought that, that meant a soul was going up to God or something. And so I started believing that maybe my soul was gonna be going up to God. Teresa already knows schizophrenia all too well. Her mother was a victim. You know, I was afraid I was gonna get schizophrenia. That's actually what I, one of my biggest fears was kind of developing that into that. 
And so I tried everything to not look at that. But in the process of me not looking at it, I guess it was progressing. It didn't go away. <laughs> it, and I kept having symptoms. Although half of the patients who suffer basic symptoms will never experience them again, the other half may be on the road to full-blown psychosis. What we're hypothesizing is that the people that continue to develop symptoms or they continue to worsen um, may have some changes in these brain structures. So with Teresa, what we're, what we're going to look at is whether or not there, there are these changes and does the brain change over time. Okay, so how does my brain look? Yeah, it looks good, Teresa. <laughs> these, are, um, these are pictures of your brain that are taken this way through your, through your head. We call them axial slices. This MRI looks very normal. There are no obvious abnormalities. The ventricular sizes are what you would expect in a normal, normal um, um, healthy person's brain. I, I've never looked at my brain before. <laughs> so I'm just trying to figure out maybe where my intuition is or where when I dream or all those things. <laughs> For the moment, Teresa's preventive treatment seems effective. As long as she continues with medication, the symptoms may not recur. But will Teresa remain committed to a lifetime course of powerful antipsychotic medications based on a single schizophrenic episode? My hope is to help, um, help Teresa control the symptoms, when she's all better, prevent relapses in the future. But we don't know how long people should stay on medication um, and it's tough to commit to lifelong medication with just um, one one episode that's the kind of thing that Teresa and I will be talking about um, over over time how I see my future today um, well it, that's kind of a hard question for me to answer because I'm just taking this a day at a time literally one day at a time on the razor edge of paranoia and hallucination, day after day, until the day medical science breaks down the walls of madness. I think we're getting better and better at treating schizophrenia, and now the majority of patients with schizophrenia uh, live in the community, and uh, often are very well, um, and may require only short admissions into hospital. Considering from where we've come in terms of our knowledge of schizophrenia, we know a great deal now, um, but we're on the verge of knowing an enormous amount more that will make a huge difference in our ability to diagnose and treat this disorder. And I really believe that we have the opportunity within our, almost within our grasp, to prevent or develop a cure for schizophrenia. Uh, I'm hopeful that there'll be a uh, more effective treatments will come to pass. The more we learn uh, from basic science research, the more uh, ammunition is available to design new medications that will be more effective with fewer side effects. Uh, and it's quite possible that in the future there may be a cure. Modern advances in medication have freed the victims of schizophrenia from the shackles of institutional life, but they remain the prisoners of their own minds. For Sean, support from his twin brother gives him strength to live. He continues to draw whenever he finds the peace of mind. Teresa is working as a mother's aide while pursuing her artwork. Dr. John Nash is developing new mathematical theories at Princeton. And his son Johnny is living at home and struggling with his persistent hallucinations. Steve Weiner died on March 28, 1998, at the age of 49, of complications stemming from his constant bouts with mental illness. I'm going to be in the movies. You guys pay to see me in the movies. This is Hollywood, man. This is Hollywood. You're in the It's Hollywood. You guys can't be in it because I'm a star. Film that guy for a minute, Les. Get him in the picture. I'm, I'm O.J. Simpson cousin. 
Okay, you're, you'll be in Hollywood pretty soon, man. Okay. I'll pay to see you. <laughs>